Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus, whose birth we are about to celebrate. Amen. We turn our attention back to today's Old Testament lesson, which began with these words, Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. This is God's word. Dear Christian friends, can you even imagine Christmas without music? Of course, it's certainly possible. The deaf can't hear music at Christmas time, and yet there's a reason that, politically correct language aside, we do refer to that as a handicap. This is not how God intended it to be. God wants us to hear. God wants us to sing. God invented music and he gave man the creative powers to compose music. Music is a gift from God. God inspired songs in scripture, the songs of David, Mary, Zechariah, Simeon, for example. Music comes from a glad heart and then in turn, music produces a glad heart. Through Zephaniah, God tells his people, Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Jerusalem. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Why? Because the Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. These words are a prophecy of Christ's advent, written, as the Hebrews are wont to do, in the past tense, because 700, 600 years before Christ was born, this was already as good as done when Zephaniah first preached these words. Sing, shout, rejoice, and be glad, because your Lord takes your punishment away. Because your Lord takes your fear away and guards you. Because the Lord quiets you with his love and sings to you. In the Lutheran Study Bible, which uses the ESV, it's interesting that the heading over the very first part of chapter 1 in Zephaniah is the coming judgment on Judah. And then the next heading is, the day of the Lord is near. And the next heading is, judgment on Judah's enemies. And then the next heading, at the beginning of chapter 3, judgment on Jerusalem and on the nations. And so what a shocking turn of events it is then, when over verse 9 of chapter 3, the final chapter of Zephaniah, it suddenly says the conversion of the nations. And verse 9 reads, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. And then the heading right over our text. Israel's joy and restoration. Israel had its judgment coming. And they would get it indeed, just like the rest of the world. Zephaniah was a contemporary of Jeremiah, prophesying just as the Babylonian captivity was coming. 
The inhabitants of Judah were in rebellion against God, just as so many are today. Despite their rebellion against God and his laws and ways, nonetheless, the people of Judah were convinced that they were pretty good people, just like today. Zephaniah had to say what he said, and God had to do what he did. Looking at our own country, if we're willing to be honest, we see the same things. It's not as easy to look at yourself and your own country, though, as it is to look at other lands and other people. At least honestly so. Just think about it, though. There are things that if people had done them 20 years ago, you would have said, oh, look what they're doing. And now you do them. Because we change our standards as our world gets worse around us. It's hard for us to look at ourselves honestly in the light of God's unchanging law. And we try to justify ourselves. Even among Christians, you'll, you'll hear the oldest of all false religions, namely works righteousness, seasoned with just a little bit of New Testament grace. I'm pretty good. I'm one of those people that, that gives it my all. I try hard. I'm certainly better than a lot of other folks I know. I'm certainly not like those jerks that I see and read about in the news, for goodness sake. So I'm really not so bad. Yeah, there's a few things about me that are imperfect. I'll count on God to forgive those. That's where that little bit of New Testament grace gets seasoned on top of our false religion, works righteousness. Sounds pretty modern, and yet... That is also an exact description of the people of Jerusalem that Zephaniah preached to. And it's that false religion that sent them into a well-deserved captivity. That's what caused Solomon's temple to be leveled. Think about it. It sounds so rational and so reasonable. It's basically our national religion in America. And it's precisely why our country is in the boat it's in. If you think you're pretty good, well then you believe the exact opposite of what Isaiah preached when he said all our righteous acts all our self-proclaimed good deeds are as filthy rags. Judah was living in comfort and luxury. And we're doing pretty good for ourselves too. But it's purely because of God's fatherly divine mercy. Not because we have earned or deserved it. What we deserve is punishment, just like Judah and then Babylon afterwards. That's why Zephaniah tells us we have something to sing about. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. God certainly has not said, it's okay, no problem. Hey, <laughs> you know, nobody's perfect. God is just and holy and demands punishment for sin. Those words in our text still stand. Your punishment what God did do is to send his son as your scapegoat to take your punishment away. And that is what Christmas is really all about. He was punished for our iniquities. He was bruised 
for our transgressions, and by his stripes we are healed. When we ponder what God did to his own dear son, we can begin to realize how awful our sinful lives really are in God's eyes. Those lives that we cavalierly describe as okay and not so bad or even pretty good. Look at your hands. And now picture what they look like with big, big holes in them. Those holes that you don't have in your hands that are in Jesus' hands, that tells you what your punishment is that you deserve that Jesus took away. And that's why Christmas is worth singing about. Our rescuer from certain death and torture came into the world on Christmas. And now that our punishment is gone, God will defend us from all our enemies. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart. O daughter of Jerusalem, the Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. Remember the heading I mentioned over chapter 3, verse 9 in the ESV, the conversion of the nations? Remember verse 9, for at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord, so that when Zephaniah, now in chapter 3, speaks to Jerusalem and Zion, he's speaking to this new people, this restored Israel, this New Testament Israel, namely the church of Jesus Christ, made up of Jews and Gentiles, people of all nations who trust in Jesus as their Savior. Jesus protects us from our real enemies, the devil, the world, and our own old Adam. Satan is our greatest enemy. He has his greedy eyes set on each of us. Ooh, one more soul to torture. One more set of the sweet music of screams for me to listen to through all eternity. That's all we are to him. Remember that this entire promise in Zephaniah's scroll is surrounded by threats of destruction and proclamations of damnation from God. Without God's word, without faith, that's what awaits people. That's what awaited so many in old Jerusalem and old Zion. Because they didn't arm themselves with God's word and they fell away. Satan dragged them away from the faith and they were defenseless. That's exactly what Satan wants to do with us. God defends us, but he doesn't do it with weapons of steel. He does it with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. How easy it is for us to poo-poo the power of Satan. That's why St. Peter wrote, be serious, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him and stand firm in the faith. You take up the sword of the Spirit. And then there's that other enemy, the world. Now it's not hard to see that there are 
many enemies of the faith in the world. Every Muslim terror attack makes that clear. We also see it in all the, the secular attacks on Christianity, the threats to sue butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers for not praising godless lifestyles. But the world is a greater danger to our faith in its far more subtle undermining of the truths of God's word. Darwinism, Freudian psychology, climate cultism, multicultural relativism, university indoctrination, pseudo-scholarly attacks on the text of Holy Scripture, and so on. And then if none of that works, well, then there's always the many allures of the world. Wealth, power, earthly comfort, and success. The devil and the world are very real and dangerous enemies. But so is the third member of the unholy trinity. Ourselves, our old Adam, our old sinful flesh, which tempts us to spiritual laziness or the personal triumphalism, oh, I'm just fine, I'll be okay, don't worry about me. Only God can protect us from these powerful foes. And that's what he vows to do. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel, the Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, and he is mighty to save. God will rescue us from every evil attack. But how? Not with weapons of steel or armies of men, but by arming us with the sword of the Spirit. If you want to get to heaven safely, Take up the word of God, the sword of the Lord. Remain in me, Jesus said, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. And there's one more thing to sing about at Christmas time the Lord's abiding love. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord will take great delight in you, He will quiet you with His love, He will rejoice over you with singing. The reason the Lord takes away our punishment and the reason the Lord is willing to defend us with his great might is because of his great love for us. In love, he sent his son for you at Christmas. And out of love for you, he led him to the cross. In love, God washed away your sins in baptism and made you lovable in the blood of Christ. He took you up in his arms and he gently quiets you with his love. And then he sings to you. He sings about you. Of all the songs of Christmas, this is the greatest carol of all. Think about it. The Lord delights in you. God loves you so much that he sings a lullaby to you and about you. Just like your dear mommy did when you were a little baby in order to quiet you down and put you at peace. And face it, there's plenty of stuff that makes us adults want to cry like a baby. Worries abound. Financial fears, family difficulties, anxieties about health, 
There are those worries that revolve around the heart and the conscience as well. Can God really open up heaven to such a miserable sinner as me? After everything that I've done, and then along comes the music of God. God's Christmas lullaby to us. He delights in us because of Christ. He quiets us with his love and he rejoices over us with singing. Isn't that enough to make us sing back the carols of Christmas? Oh yes it is. Trust God who removed your punishment. Keep yourself armed with his word and keep listening to his song of love to you. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.